<laughs> wow. Praise the Lord. This is going to be interesting. If you're looking at this kayak right now, you're seeing a very long kayak. And to give you an example of just how big this turkey is, I'm five foot nine. And I'm putting my feet right here where you can see this front uh, skirt that's pushed up. And I'm laying down and barely touching the chair. And behind the chair is still two feet or more. That is a long kayak. Technically, it is about 12 feet, 4 inches. Now, it's a little bit longer than that because I measured and it came out to be about 12 feet, 6. But that's fully inflated and I'm getting ready to dedicate it today because this is the kayak that we've been waiting for. This is the Sea Evo 370. This is a very, very well reviewed, highly recommended kayak for all beginners and intermediate people. It's rated for class three rapids. It is has a type of material that's not just PVC, kind of like this Explorer K2, which is an inflatable boat, but it's specially designed with over 30 years experience by Sea Eagle in preparing this and having it made in such a way that even the Coast Guard uses some of the boats that Sea Eagle has designed. It is recommended for up to 600 and 50 pounds and three people. So it's a it's a full-fledged, really durable kayak. I mean, I'm amazed it has 90 days money back guarantee with five years of warranty. And the kayaks don't have that kind of stuff. I mean, sure, they say lifetime, but that's when they're selling some plastic thing, you know, some plastic boat thing. You'd really have a hard time breaking. But one of the things that I wanted to bring out about this Sea Eagle and about teaching from Kayakandu is that this one is designed, it's made, and it has a history of being a very well thought out and prepared boat. The T, the other kayak that I have that's yellow is pretty cheap. You know, it's only about 90 bucks. It's inflatable. You know, it might be 100. K2, I redesigned it and, like I said yesterday, modified it to make it worthy to be a kayak that could go through some rapids and white water and go in still waters. But this one is the real thing. Sometimes in scriptures we find people talking about a form of Jesus or a type of Jesus that I don't know. Now, I'm a Jesus freak and I've been saved for 40 years. And I hear people talk about Jesus, you know, would kill people or Jesus took his whip and he beat those that were in the temple, you know, the merchants and the buyers and the sellers and drove out the animals so that he was a violent person or that he said to Peter, you know, to buy a sword. I don't know where they get the idea that Jesus does violence or is violent. He's called the Prince of Peace. So that is a knockout as it were, of Jesus. That's not the real Jesus. You can pretend that that is. You can lie about it. You can sell it to people like this boat that, you know, it's a knockout of this boat because they're both similar in style, except for once you get this one, you go, oh, wow, what a difference the real is compared to the not real or the imitation. Now, this imitation already has three holes in it. The seams have pulled apart in the front and the back. A puncture has developed in the bottom of the boat where I patched them all and that's fine. You know, I like the yellow boat. It's kind of pretty. It's actually beautiful to look at. It's wonderful to, you know, kind of play with. But it's really not the real thing and I'm getting ready to launch this to see what it's going to be like because it's narrower, which is really surprising. It's clean lines 
it's very well efficiently made and structured and it's solid. I mean, this thing is hard. I mean, it's just amazing to me what a difference the real is compared to the not real. The same thing is true about Jesus. When Jesus is someone who is like no other, when he is called the Son of God, the Son of Man, when it says that he did not even bruise a, or he did not even break a bruised reed or put out a smoking flax, I tend to see a different kind of Jesus than what people are talking about when they tell me who they follow. Now, I don't know about you, but in the latter days, we're told there are many false Christs out there. There are many anti-Christs out there. There is a spirit of anti-Christs out there. There is a false teaching and false prophecies out there. There's a lot of false. As a matter of fact, if I was to sit in this in-text Explorer K2 and tell you that it's a wonderful design built boat that's a kayak that's perfect for whitewater, I'd be lying. It would be a lie. And that's what some people are doing about Jesus. But when the real has come, it is so obvious when I'm sitting here looking at the two that this looks more impressive, the yellow one. But when you see and touch and feel and sit inside this Sea Eagle 370, you go, oh yeah, wow, this is like smooth sailing. And that's kind of what it's like when you encounter Jesus really. It's smooth sailing. God didn't say that it would be easy, and he didn't say that it would be all, you know, without trials and tribulations, like we said yesterday about the storms of life that come up and how you have to have Jesus in your boat, which especially now, and you better have Jesus in your boat because you'd be able to keep that boat afloat. Well, this one, I got a feeling is going to solve the situation for any storms that come up because it'll float. As a matter of fact, I'm told that you open up the drain hole in the back when you are in white water so that it'll drain out automatically. It'll just kind of like slosh out because this boat will float full of water. That one might, but I'm not so sure. So it's interesting to me the differences the real is from the imitation. We're told that Bar Jesus wanted to be like Paul. We're told that this soothsayer, this astrologer, this person wanted to imitate what Peter was doing and Paul was doing. And in the book of Acts, it says that he even tried to buy the gift of the Holy Spirit. I know there are people out there that are doing that now. I know that Donald Trump portrays himself as being a friend of Christians. He doesn't say he's a Christian yet but he's running for office and portraying himself as something other than what he really is. A rich man who is willing to sell and buy to get his way in the office. If you believe in that, then you vote for him. If you don't believe in salesmen in office, then don't vote for him. My point is simply that he's not what he portrays himself out to be. He is and always has been a rich man, and Jesus warned about rich men. How hard is it for a rich man to enter into heaven? Jesus said, it is easier for a camel to go through an eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into heaven. If Donald Trump sold all his wealth and gave it to the poor, then I would believe in him and I'd tell you to vote for him. Otherwise, his riches are his God. And he has said that greed is his motto. So what can I say? If you believe in him, then you're fooled. So, likewise, if I believed that this boat was perfectly prepared for everything that I'm going to run into on a lake or a river, I'd be foolish because it's not certified, it's not designed for it, but it's designed to look like it is. This one has certification. This one has the Coast Guard or whatever you call it, lakes and, yeah, I think it's Coast Guard. Um, certifications for class three, up to class three rapids. That means that anything less than that, man, it's smooth sailing. So one of the things you need to do is to prove all things, hold fast that which is good. Don't always accept what people are saying. Don't always buy into, you know, what looks good. 
but rather examine according to the scriptures those things that are true. For we have a more sure word of prophecy, that is, Jesus. And he will speak of himself, and he doesn't need anyone to interpret for him. One of the things that Peter warned us about is that we are told to grow up, or I should say Paul in Ephesians says it, but it says to grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Jesus. Now what that means is later identified in um, 2 Peter 3.18, where he says, the body is of Jesus. Let no man beguile you of your reward in a voluntary humility and worshiping of angels, intruding into those things which he has not seen, being he puffed up in his fleshy mind and not holding the head or holding Jesus, from which all the body joints and bands have nourishment, ministered, and knit together, increased with the increase of knowledge of God. Grow in grace in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. In other words, what Peter is saying, and what Paul is saying, is that you got to get to know Jesus. Once you know Jesus, you know that it, even if the Calvary Chapel tells you it's okay to kill, it's not. Jesus said, love your enemies, and you can't love your enemies by killing them. I'm sorry. You may think that that's not an answer, but it is. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego didn't jump into the furnace and say, hey, you know, we're going to kill you because our God's going to be with us. No, they allowed themselves to be tossed into fire because they would not bow down to Nebuchadnezzar's statue. And Nebuchadnezzar was ministered to by the fact that they did not die. So you see, it's not about protectionism, which is what a lot of Christians will say, well, you got to have a gun, you got to protect your family. Tell me how Jesus protected himself and I'll do the same. He trusted in the Lord with all his heart. He leaned not in his own understanding, but in all his ways he acknowledged God and God directed his path because even God the Father said Jesus learned obedience by the things he suffered. That means suffering is good for you. Trials are wonderful. They will prove to you why you might not want to go out into a class four rapid in this yellow boat, but that you can easily survive if you were skilled at it in this boat. It can do a class four, but I don't recommend it. It's not rated for it, but it's been seen that some people have done it. Now, one of the things we're going to do today in dedicating this is we're going to go out and put it in water and see how it floats. I want to see what makes the boat float. I don't know what makes your boat float. Maybe you need to put your faith in something that's unreliable, untested, uncertified, and untrue. Maybe you do that regularly. Maybe you think that's what faith is. But you see, my faith is intelligent. My faith is logical. My faith has a foundation that is sure and a cornerstone that is rock solid. That is my relationship with Jesus. You see, I got saved by Jesus calling out to me and me responding to him. I didn't make the choice. He chose me. And because he chose me, I responded to him in that same way that he loved me. I choose to love others. So really, it's a matter of trading one thing for another. Even as we're told to grow in the grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, once you begin to understand it's not about your righteousness, but it is about His grace being given to you, then you'll understand what the race is. It's not about making yourself perfect. It's about helping others learn about and get to know Jesus in a personal and intimate way. I don't want you to go to Bible school and learn doctrine. I don't want you to go to Bible school and learn the basic believers class or to go to a Calvary Chapel class to learn what Calvary Chapel believes. I don't care. What I do care about is this. You get to know Jesus and you get to know his Father because that is the definition of what eternal life is. When you know Jesus and you get to know his Father, then you can trust in the Lord. Because if you're trusting in man, they'll fail you. If you're trusting in Calvary Chapel, it will eventually fail you in some way. When I was there at Calvary Chapel close to Mason in the early days, everybody talked about visiting people in church or visiting people in the hospitals, but I was there for over a year or two years, and I was never visited in the hospital all the times I went in. And I wasn't that far away, just down the street. So the reality is I didn't hold it against them, but rather it was a time that God 
a portion for me to be alone with him. My relationship with Jesus is solid. My relationship with Calvary Chapels is wonderful in the sense that there are certain people I know that are likewise of the same mindset and the same relationship that they are personally devoted to Jesus. To them, I look at and I see and I smile and wait. The rest, I know they are following doctrines or they're following expositional teachings and they're interpreting God for themselves. Good luck with that. I hope it works out for you. But in any religion, whether it's Calvary Chapel or Pentecostals or, you know, Kim Davis with her apostolic, you know, kind of like she doesn't believe in the Trinity thing and all kinds of people like that in my Huckabee who's given up on, I guess, being a pastor and wants to be a president. God knows there's a wrong way of looking at things. But, hey, you know, I mean, if he's willing to sell out his faith for, you know, the government, um, okay. But somehow I think I see fruit in their lives that I don't want anything to do with. You see, there are things about this boat I like. There are things that I've changed in this boat to make it more like this one, to be sturdier. But when it comes to actually trusting in either one, I'll put my trust in the real thing. I'll put my trust in the Lord where it belongs. Because when it comes to this boat versus, or this boat versus that boat, I'll take this boat over that boat. Now, I like that one because I've grown fond of it, but it's liable to sink one of these days. I mean, I've done a lot to it and it, it's got all kinds of gear in it. I've got it customized and everything. And, my wife won't let me touch this one because it's already designed and it's already ready. But, hey, you know, sooner or later she'll get tired and bored and I'll customize this one. <laughs> she doesn't see this. Don't tell my wife. But, hey, one of the things that we know is that when we now only see through a dark dimly, or we three see through a glass scarcely, or we are looking through a dirty window. We only see in part and we only know in part. But when Jesus comes, then we shall know him in his fullness. We shall see him as he is. We know that he's not only the suffering servant. We know that he's not only the Messiah who came, but he's the King of kings and Lord of lords who comes, the Moshiach. He is the King of the Jews. He shall come and reign. But he doesn't need violence to do anything. The word of his tongue, the tongue that he has, the word of the Lord comes out of his mouth like a sharp two-edged sword. He doesn't need a sword. He has a sword, just one word, and the seas were made calm. One word and the valley of Megiddo will be filled with blood. One word and he can restore your soul to peace. All he has to say is peace, be still, and you will have joy. But the reality of what we're doing is something that is not acceptable in the sight of God. And that is to portray ourselves as God or portray something else or someone else as God. To put our little idols up. Even this could become an idol. But to put anything in the place of Jesus makes you a false teacher, a false witness, a false prophet, a false leader. Get to know what the real is. Otherwise, you will fail in these latter days. The Spirit of God is pulling back, as it were. He is withdrawing his influence from the world because he's getting ready to go back to heaven and be there while he takes the bride with him to be at the wedding supper of the Lamb. Should you be preparing yourself, then you are growing in the knowledge of Jesus, as we were told in the scriptures, as we were told in the devotional today. As it is said in 2 Peter 3.18, grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. That means get to know Jesus more and more. Don't get so wrapped up in your theology. Everyone I see coming out of Bible school, I seem to be arguing with more and more. They don't seem to know Jesus, and they don't know as much theology as they think they do. They seem to be getting this ego or pride where they somehow... Oh, well, they got a background in interpretation. They got a background in application. They got a background in systemic thinking. But they've never been examined to see whether they be in the faith and they don't know to examine themselves in light of a personal relationship with God and have God speak to them individually. In light of that, 
I would rather have God tell me what to do every day than to sit down and think I know what I'm doing in the way that I should go. Trust in the Lord, as we said in Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. And if you don't understand anything that's going on in your world, then go to James 1, 5. James, the brother of Jesus, made the biggest mistake in the world. He didn't recognize God, much like most of the Jews did at that time either. But when he did, he wrote these words. If any man lack wisdom, let him ask of God, who abradeth not, but give it to all men liberally. In other words, God's not going to beat you up for asking him to direct you. He's not going to beat you up for asking him for wisdom in every decision. He wants you to be his servant. He wants you to acknowledge him as your God. That means in everything, you should be seeking his will, his way, and his love. Because if you do, you won't be satisfied with the imitation, but you'll want the real when it's coming.